I, uh, uh, time is short, and Roger has asked me to be brief, and so I'll do that in my New Yorker style by speaking extremely fast and reducing a 40-minute lecture to three seconds. Uh, and there was a mention made of the fact that uh, I didn't write Blind Faith in order to make money, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't like to. Uh, and so uh, with the holiday season approaching, I want you all to recognize that it makes a lovely gift. And uh, I want to I answer the question, um, or I want to examine the question, is religion good for your health? And uh, you, you can't possibly pick up a, a popular magazine or newspaper or look at a uh, uh, on television or hear radio for more than eight or ten days without hearing some story about the uh, miraculous benefits of religious activity for health. Uh, in, uh, within the past two years, Prevention Magazine published an article uh, whose title was How Religious Faith Can Make You Almost Invulnerable to Disease. Uh, the uh, Newsweek had a cover story on science and religion. U.S. News and World Report had a similar cover story. There are many popular books, books by Harold Koenig, Dale Matthews, uh, Christina Puchalski, uh, Jeff Levin, all of which make claims about the, the health benefits of religious activity. And it's not just among the general public. The interest is widespread within medicine, too. Uh, next month, Harvard will uh, have its uh, now annual uh, continuing medical education meeting on spirituality and health. Uh, the North Carolina School of Me uh, North Dakota School of Medicine has has uh, recently organized a program on prayer and health. Duke has a center on spirituality, theology, and, and medicine, and the George Washington University has the George Washington Institute of uh, uh, on spirituality and health, whose acronym is G Wish. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm I'm interested in is why is this happening now, and there are a number of reasons which I uh, go over in the book. Uh, we don't have enough time to explore them in, in detail now. But I'd like to at least identify a few. One of them is uh, what we've seen over the past 40 years or so, a rise in irrationalism. And uh, the evidence of that is everywhere, but best found on the Amazon website. If you just look at what books sell, um, among the self-help books, there is no limit to uh, books that are wildly irrational. You, I, I'm sure you don't know who Dr. Doreen Virtue is. I didn't either until I started looking at this. She has, uh, I don't know what her PhD is in, but she has books on angel medicine, fairy medicine, crystal medicine. Uh, the, and of course, they're all the same. The nouns just replace each other in the different books. Uh, she has 100 or so items on, on uh, Amazon. And she's just a mere piker, though, compared to Deepak Chopra, who has 1,000 items that you can buy on Amazon. Books, tapes, CDs, mugs, greeting cards. Uh, uh, the, uh, another reason, and one that I'm, I'm sorry Chuck Harper isn't here, uh, although he's heard me give this talk before, uh, another reason why this issue has arisen now is because of the, ro uh, the role of advocacy foundations and principally the Templeton Foundation. I want to uh, I, I want to make clear that the picture that you heard yesterday is only one picture of the role of the Templeton Foundation. On the Templeton Foundation's website, uh, when I uh, was writing the book, is the following. The, the, uh, the aim of the Foundation's initiative on spirituality and health is, quote, to document the medical aspects of spiritual practice, uh, or the, the positive medical aspects of spiritual practice. The Foundation hopes to contribute to the reintegration of faith into modern life. It doesn't say to determine whether there's a benefit. It says to document it, assuming a priori what should be demonstrated. Uh, and Templeton has supported all of the high-profile researchers. I mentioned this briefly last night. All of the books written by proponents of uh, uh, the beneficial effects of religion and medicine are indebted to Templeton. All of the authors have received Templeton fu uh, funding. So that's another reason. A, th a third reason is the cyclical waxing and waning of religious sentiment in the United States is epitomized by uh, work, uh, works by sociologists uh, who document uh, the rise, uh, the uh, great awakenings in, in religious sentiment in the United States, according to some, we're in the fourth great awakening right now. And so that may account for some of the interest. A, th a fourth is the uncritical media. You just saw a uh, cover of, news, uh, of uh, Time, you know, what the, uh, on the cover of Newsweek, the, par the sister magazine, so to speak, the cover of Newsweek is devoted to the clash of evangelicals. Uh, in writing the book, I uh, interviewed a number of journalists and was actually startled to learn something that may be obvious to you, that journalists and, and, and uh, media 
conduct polls just the way politicians do, and they want to determine what are uh, the issues that will sell their product. And the biggest issue that sells the product is religion. The second biggest one is health. And so there's a very nice confluence of stories about religion and health for market purposes only. And the fifth uh, uh, reason why there's an interest in religion and health today is the widespread dissatisfaction with contemporary technological medicine. Uh, the Times had a great story uh, about the conversion of uh, uh, the, the transformation of a, from person to patient as you enter the hospital. And of course, uh, those of you who have been uh, hospitalized recently recognize that this is a commonly uh, uh, cited observation. You are uh, treated with uh, less concern than you would like. You're treated like a collection of organ systems or even a piece of meat uh, as you uh, become a, a patient. Um, and so uh, those are some of the reasons. And, and I want, want you to be clear about what's at stake here. This is not just a, 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 a concern with nothing much at issue. The, uh, what's at stake is at least in the view of the proponents of a connection between religion and health and religion and medicine, is a radical transformation of how medicine is practiced in the United States. Uh, prominent physicians have argued that their aim is to tear down the wall of separation between religion and medicine. They've also asserted that the future of medicine is prayer and Prozac. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, several physicians have recommended that, that Physicians conduct a spiritual history, just like a social history, an intake for all new patients, and annually thereafter, a spiritual history. Uh, and, and like so many facets of American uh, society, you can find something from H.L. Mencken that, that, epitomize, that captures the, the situation. Mencken wrote, uh, for every complex problem, there's a solution that's simple, neat, and wrong. Uh, uh, nobody disputes that. Uh, Religion brings comfort in times of difficulty, whether it's medically related or otherwise. That's not an issue. I don't dispute that. I don't think anybody should dispute that, whether we like it or not. The question is, can medicine add anything to that? And I think that the answer is probably no. So in the time that remains, I want to ask and answer three questions. Is the effort to bring religion into clinical medicine based on good science? Does it represent good medicine? And even, does it represent good religion? And to anticipate, I think, the, uh, as you can imagine, the answer in all three cases is no. So is it good science? The proponents uh, assert that there are thousands of papers connecting religion to medicine. And if you look in the medical literature, in fact, that's true. But it's an exaggeration and it's misleading in, in certain critical respects. Koenig, uh, Harold Koenig, who's one of the principal uh, 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 proponents of this position, has uh, written there 1,200. Uh, such studies, 77% of them show a beneficial effect of religion and health. Others report the same thing. The question is, are these studies about religion and health really relevant to claims about the benefits of religion to, me to, to health? And I'm talking about physical health, incidentally. I have not looked at the literature on mental health. So if you look at the literature, you can indeed find that there are loads and loads of studies. However, Many of those studies have nothing whatsoever to do with claims about health benefits of religious activity. Uh, my colleague Amelia Bagella and I uh, looked at, we, we did a Medline search, uh, Medline's the uh, database of the National Library of Medicine. Uh, we, in the year 2000, uh, for, for all the papers published in the year 2000, we looked at everything that came up when we simply put in the word religion. And the 266 papers were identified. We read all 266 abstracts and determined that only 17% of those 266 papers were really relevant to the proposition about health benefits to religious activity. But what were the others about? Denominational differences, Jews versus Christians, Protestants versus Catholics. Those are about religion and health. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the health benefits of religious practices. Some of the others were about medical uh, uh, influ uh, religious influences on medical decision making. We all know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't accept blood transfusions. Others were about health fairs. Uh, still others were about uh, uh, religious convictions as a consequence rather than a cause of medical decision making. Sometimes when you, be, when you get sick, uh, you may become more uh, devout or you may become less devout. So the, the claim that there are loads of studies is true but irrelevant to the, to the fundamental issue. What about the studies that are legitimately related to, relig uh, to health benefits of religious practices? 
To answer that question, we thought it best to look at the evidence that is cited by the proponents as demonstrating this. And so we examined and read in detail all of the almost 90 papers in two chapters of Harold Koenig's voluminous Handbook of Religion and Health dedicated to Sir John Templeton, uh, a book that's that thick that reviews thousands and thousands of papers. And we read all of the papers related to cardiovascular disease and hypertension, which is the area of my day job. Uh, and we wanted to see how many of them were really solid, methodologically solid and could form the basis of a conclusion that religious practices are good for your health. Let me give you, just to give you the flavor of some of them, let me give you uh, uh, details about one. Paper in Physiology and Behavior in 1991 in which 52 male college students were taught Buddhist meditation and compared to 30 control subjects. This is, this is what the, the handbook reports. Meditation subjects had lower blood pressure at follow-up. That's all the handbook reports. Now, for those of you who've gone to graduate school have certainly heard the admonitions, be careful about secondary sources. This is the case in point about being careful about secondary sources. If you look only at that information, you come away with the sense that meditation is associated with lower blood pressure. If you read the paper itself, not just what's cited in the handbook, you determine that there was no random assignment to the two different conditions, the meditation and the control condition. In fact, what the, what the investigators did was they recruited a bunch of college students over the summer, some of whom volunteered to be cloistered in a monastery for two months while the others simply did whatever college students do over the summer, flip burgers, work construction, something like that. The only activity that those cloistered in the monastery got was walking a mile a day in order to receive food. And so, you know, we could have put you in jail and you would have had lower blood pressure at the end of a two-month period of incarceration compared to what college kids do over the summer. So there are all sorts of problems with self-selection and other uh, prob uh, problems associated with uh, the, a failure to do a randomized controlled trial here. So a great many of the studies that are identified as, by proponents as supporting the, the, uh, the claim that religious practices are good for your health suffer from significant methodological flaws like that. The failure to control for confounders and covariates and the other significant problem, the failure to control for, the, for multiple comparisons, the idea epitomized by Robert Park's Sharpshooter's fallacy, I don't know, you know who Robert Park is, the physicist who's an ardent critic of junk science. He reports uh, that the sharpshooter's fallacy is when the sharpshooter empties the six gun into the side of the barn, then draws the bullseye. If you, go, if you test hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis, sooner or later you're going to find something that achieves statistical significance. And then you say, aha, there it is. That shows that religious practices are good for your health. So when you eliminate the papers that fail to have significant methodological, uh, that, that when you eliminate all the papers that have methodological flaws, out of the 89 or so papers in that chapter, four were methodologically sufficient to justify claims about uh, uh, the health benefits of religious practices. So the evidence on a scientific ground, the evidence that there is a, a connection between religious devotion and religious involvement and better health is extremely weak, weak and inconclusive. Were all those papers in a referee journal? Yeah, so most of them were in referee journals. What about, what about those four? What, what did you think were the four? Were, the four were reasonably sound, and one of them was about meditation. You know, they're not, not huge samples, but, but it's four out of, out of 89 or so. And uh, uh, even some of the four, Let's say that the four, I, don't, I haven't looked back at this in a, in a while. The four, let's say they were, they were solid, but they're only four. So on, on, the, on science. Excuse me, if you want to ask a question, could you wait till I get a mic? Because it just doesn't go on tape. It's pointless. So, so the question, so I think the, the, science, the answer to this question is a good science. It's clearly no. It's not good science.